friends, and welcome to the second episode of season two of the Paleo Post podcast. This season, as some of you may already know, is going to be a little different than last season, especially when it comes to our new co-host, Dr. George Nash. We're going to be having a lot of fun this season. You're going to be bringing a lot of fun and enthusiasm through the airwaves to you. And if you want to learn about the paleo world from where our ancestors originated, stay up to date on news, books, and especially anything relating to paleo art, and just have a good time talking about it, then stay tuned because your weekly uh, weekly paleo post is incoming. I know right now we are used to Genevieve's. Woohoo! So I'll give a little one right there because everyone is used to that meeting. The show is starting. So. Hello, George. How are you this week? Um, I'm okay, thank you, Seth. I, I, I think I said t- the last time we spoke um, on the podcast that I had problems with my eyesight, but I've had my operation about two days ago, and guess what? I can now read. <laughs> read and drive, which is the most important <laughs> thing. So yeah, all, the, is... all, the, all, the, all the things I take for granted are, are coming back. Which is wonderful. And, you know, it's just amazing how fast that your recovery has been. I mean, are oh you my goodness up, me, yeah. Are you up to where they think you'll be, or are you still recovering? I'm still recovering, but I'm okay. a, I'm, a, I'm a very I'm a very happy hominin. <laughs> and that is wonderful. All right, so guys, uh, we're changing the format of the show just slightly, where we're going to be chatting about news stories like we usually do. Uh, we're going to be talking about more, though, because we want to make the show a little longer. And each episode, besides a few awesome stories of personal experiences and anecdotes that George is going to be bringing to the show, he is also, if not the author, uh, the reader of quite a few very interesting but niche uh, books relating to specific, uh, a lot of the times the UK and rock art there and Paleolithic world in the UK. So he is going to be talking about some of those books. Of course, you know, they could be about other places and other times, but those are great recommendations that he has for you guys. And so why don't we just jump right in? Uh, I will kick us off by talking about this interesting story that came out uh, right at the beginning of the month on the second. And uh, it's out of the University of Brisbane in Australia. Uh, oh, I'm so bad with names. Cassie Norman at Griffith University of Brisbane, Australia, and her colleagues. Have you heard of uh, Dogger Lunch, George? I'm sure you have. I have, in fact, yes, yes. It's very much like our own Doggerland between the British Isles and the European continent. Can you explain briefly for those who might not know what Doggerland is, uh, what it is, and then I'll get into this yeah. discovery? Yeah, sure. Um, if we were to do a, a bathonic map of the world, there are places around uh, our coastlines which were once land. It's as simple as that. And we have, say, for example, uh, within the British Isles, we have... Uh, at one point, about eight and a half thousand years ago, where we weren't the British Isles, we are actually connected to the European mainland. And that uh, area was called Doggerland because Doggerland was named after a bank called Dogger Bank, which was a, uh, a very, 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 um, uh, uh, um, that's what I'm looking for. It, it was a great big fishing area. And so it got called Dogger Bank. There are a number of banks. And what you've got is that uh, you've got the uh, the uh, in in particular for, for Doggerland is that we have now mapped out the whole of Doggerland just about, and we can get a really good idea about the valleys, the hills, some of the settlements. Because remember, the reason why uh, paleo uh, environmentalists were interested in this particular site, this particular area of Europe was because um, they were dredging up when they were dredging Dogger Bank, uh, artifacts from the Mesolithic, from the early Mesolithic and the Paleolithic. So that was the sort of the clue that we had a landmass underneath the uh, underneath the North Sea. And it's still being looked at as we speak. 
Uh, one other place is the Bering Strait, of course, um, which is between Alaska and uh, Siberian Russia. And then we have this really interesting area between the the archipelago of the uh, of Indonesia and Australia. And at one point, it's reckoned, uh, and again, it's a, it's a it's a really interesting point that because of the sea level, uh, the low lo the low sea level um, changes that we had during the various glaciations, um, it the the we, we the, it is reckoned that there was a landmass where people could just walk across from the archipelago of Indonesia into Northern Territories, Australia. That's exactly what, so that's exactly what they, they are looking at at the moment. Absolutely. And, you know, that's what we're looking at when we're talking about this new, um, not new landmass, a new area, as you mentioned, along the coastline, that was found in Australia, and this area was unsubmerged, meaning it was, it was land, around 27,000 to 30,000 years ago. And they believe, based on geographic and archaeological finds thus far, and of course, they just discovered this place, there's a lot left to do. The race, they think yes. It could have actually hosted between 50 and this is quite a gap, uh, quite a uh, range here between 50 and 500,000 people. Mm, yeah. I would be more on a conservative side there. <laughs> um, yes, even 50,000 seems yeah. quite a bit. It's a headline grabber. It's a headline yeah, grabber. Ab so. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, it's a very interesting find that we have this new area. I mean, there's we literally have, who knows what could be there. It's a whole new area yeah. now. That yeah. means when you look at an area this size, which the size of this landmass was about, let me see here. So, I'm, so they think that this population, you know, whether it was 50,000 or 500,000, which again, Probably not. There was a very large lake, a freshwater lake that would have supported this area, which is kind of where they're getting their population data from. That was 2,000 square kilometers, which I mean, that that's huge for a lake. That that is that's massive. I, you know, when I think of large lakes and the United States and everything, I think of you know the Great Lakes and Lake Tahoe and things like that. And I don't believe they're anywhere near that size um but so the size of this landmass the topography around australia that we're discussing was actually four hundred thousand square kilometers so actually let me look up for reference how large doggerland is uh doggerland I can find it real quickly. I know what to do. Let's use our new friendly AI that everyone is either scared of or is using already. So let's see. But so basically, this landmass was just massive. I, I, I get it in some respects because if you look at uh, Timor, uh, which is a large island, and the archipelago to the north of Timor, it's conceivable, Seth. And I think what's important about it really in many respects is that it's occurring at a time when we start to head towards that glacial maximum in the northern hemisphere. And I think what's quite exciting about this particular project is that we know a lot about what the glaciers were doing, about the glacial maximums were doing at 20,000, 18, 20,000 years ago in, uh, in the Fenniscandian, which is Europe, and the Laurentide in the north in, in, in North America. We know very little about what's going on with the isolated Alpine regions, such as Switzerland, such as uh, such as the Pyrenees, and also places like Australia, for example. You wouldn't have thought for one minute that uh, that there would have been a uh, a, a a sea level drop to uh, to, to reduce uh, to to expose a, a massive landscape. Um, during this time, 
So it, again, this is really you know quite exciting news to think about in terms of the the way modern humans, you and I, were moving across these landscapes to colonize Northern Australia, for example. Absolutely, and so for reference, so Doggerland, uh, when they quote unquote you know discovered that this mass of land was there. I believe they were calling it and might still be calling it a lost continent. Um, yes. And it is 23,000 kilometers. Which, again, if we're talking about what we are, this mass in Australia, 400,000 square kilometers. So this, this is huge. It, this well, and you also have to realize, since it's in northern Australia, that reduces, depending on what the land looked like when the first migrations happened to Australia, how yeah. much water they had to traverse. Because, you know, now we think of this huge gap of water that if we traveled across today and, you know, dug out canoes or something, which they, who knows what they had at the time. Uh, yeah. it would have been extremely difficult. And of course, it still would have been. But if there was a 400,000 kilometer coast farther ahead, it would have definitely been much easier. Uh, yeah. So, absolutely. I've, I've, st I've stood on the, uh, on, on, the, on the tip of Timor and I've looked out towards the Northern Territories, Australia. You just about see that tiny, tiny pencil line on a good day. So it is, it is a conceivable um, boat trip. But do remember, I mean, what's interesting is that we know from around about 15,000 in the northern hemisphere, between 15,000 and, say, 10,000, the sea level rise was between 50 and 70 metres, maybe even a little bit more. So that's a hell of a lot of land that would have been exposed in north, northern Europe uh, and also within the, within the Mediterranean, for example. The Mediterranean, um, you know, during the, during the last ice age uh, was a series of lakes, not a, not a sea. So right. you know, so we've seen great changes. I mean, um, I mean, the the, the clue is Koska Cave, which is um, a cave which was discovered just uh, near Marseille, uh, and it's a, the entrance to it is about thirty five meters below the current sea level. So, you know, during the Magdalenian and maybe a little bit earlier, people were walking into that cave at maybe forty meters below the present level of the sea which is now the Mediterranean. So again, just thinking about how those landscapes have shifted over the, over the, over a, a lot, well, actually in geological time, a short period of time. And I guess what, guess what? This is my environmental moan for the day. It's still happening and it's happening because <laughs> of global warming, global warming. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's, yeah, climate change. That's one thing that, uh, you know, totally kind of getting a little off topic here, which is always a fun thing to do. Climate change has always happened. You know, it's, when, even when humans weren't here, the climate was changing drastically over time. And going off topic, you know, just a little bit, which is always fun, you know, climate change has always happened. Even without yeah. humans, the climate is going to be changing drastically throughout geologic time. What's different now is anthropomorphic-driven climate change. The climate is changing faster or more drastically because of the activities that we have been doing. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. It's like, oh, well... How could we change the climate? Well, we're not changing it. We're just accelerating what's already happening. Yeah. Because of yeah. the stupid things that we're doing to the environment. Yeah. Uh, I was looking forward, Seth, in 23,000 years time to experience a, an ice age. And now I won't. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. We're going to uh, miss it. <laughs> <laughs> barring, you know, a massive volcanic eruption or something you know <laughs> yeah. um but yeah but, so it, just... but, 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 but maybe i mean i mean this is what's really interesting in terms of looking talking to geologists because we have now uh, if some of your uh some of your listeners may know about is the anthropocene which is a right. new 
geological time, which basically is the way that us modern humans have impacted the earth. And um, yeah, and also the debris we're leaving behind. So, for example, this is this is from from an archaeological point of view. When you start to dig a site, for example, any site, you have stratigraphy, and that stratigraphy could be a few centimeters, could be a few millimeters, uh, or it could be a few meters. Uh, but none, nevertheless, we've covered most of the globe with a anthropogenic, anthropogenic activity. So the Anthropocene is real. Uh, and it's again it, uh, when I was at university uh, all those years ago, um, it was just coming in that term Anthropocene, and uh, it was a debate. But um, I'm beginning to feel that it, that is the case. Now, a good example of that is that um, I, 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 one of my little things is uh, soil chem chemistry. And when I'm looking at a soil map, not a geology map, but a soil map of the British Isles, for example, there are areas which are classified as U. And U means unclassified. And the reason why they're unclassified is because they represent cities, they represent towns. And also the, uh, that the, 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 uh, the geologists studying the soil can't work out what the soil is about because there's, there's been so much stratigraphy laid down by modern humans right. over, the, over, over, the, over the millennia. And one good example is that, so for example, I did a, a, a project many, many years ago on the River Thames. On the U, on a big oxbow bend of the of the River Thames, just uh, just east of London City, and there we had to go down. I think around about nine meters, and it was nine meters of obviously um, natural developments because of the Bronze Age and because of the wet climate and whatever. But nine meters down, there was anthropogenic activity. I dug an excavation. I did an excavation opposite the Houses of Parliament again on the Thames, and I found at five, six metres below the, the the city ground level uh, near the Flint. So it oh. just gives you an idea about yeah. the influence that modern humans, us, have had on the natural landscape. Absolutely. And it's really, we can, as you said, we can do a lot. We What we can do is just drastic. Um, so... Moving to the next story, I believe you have curated a few for us this week. Yes, I have, yeah. Um, and the one site I was really wanted to look at was a site. A site actually in Cantabria. Where else? Because that's where all the all the all the rock art seems to be, be being found. <laughs> but this but this is a different sort type of archaeology. It's a, a site called uh, Lagana Lagama Cave. Uh, in Cantabria, and it's been excavated by a Spanish team from the University of Cantabria, and they've got a, a Magdalenian date of around about sixteen thousand eight hundred before present, and uh, within that, this is and this is what sort of turned me on a little bit because we can I can talk about rock art until the cows come home, uh, but with this particular site, they've uncovered a really interesting settlement site, and it really, in some respects, it sort of um, I suppose supports our. Our, our ideas, Seth, about the idea about how a cave is organised into public and private space. Yeah. So the public space is where the community lives, is usually around the entrance. There's people looking out there looking for the megafauna going past that cave or, or they're dragging animals into that cave for butchery and for carcass utilisation, bone production, flint production. It's all happening within that entrance area. But as you go further back, uh, I, I use the term sanctuary. It becomes a sanctuary for symbolic behaviour. Uh, and this particular team have uncovered a, a really nice settlement site with over 4,000 um, fossils. Fossils, uh, and, and again, the, the sort of the, um, the the terminology is a little bit vague. I, w I, w I would like to know what 4,000 fossil fossils it actually is. I probably it is probably uh, animal bone and human bone, but mainly animal animal bone. Uh, because I suspect that anything to do with burial is further into that private space of that cave. Um, but also what's interesting is that it's been very well defined or delineated by a series of stalagmites, which form a sort of oval, an oval or an ovate uh, shape. And within that ovate shape, this is where you've got all your activity within that cave uh, in terms of, of, of indus industry and, in all terms, and also in the terms of habitation. So that was really quite refreshing, and also they found within the um, within the, the cave um, stratigraphy uh, around about again about about five thousand uh, pieces of bone, 
flint tools. Now the bone tools were interesting because some of them were decorated. So quite clearly there's an interesting, there's a need to brush away from the utilitarian use of, a, of, a, of, an, of an implement such as a bone pin, for example, and, and then there's a need to decorate it. Um, again, I would argue that by decorating it, you're also weakening the structure of the, of the bone. But right. it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter um, because uh, again, it's people showing their their uh, their artistic endeavor, their symbolic endeavor uh, when they are producing these these tools. So it's it's very very interesting indeed. And I would dare say, I mean, they, I don't think they've finished the site yet, and they've got to go down uh, even deeper. Um, but what was really interesting about this particular site was it wasn't excavated. So they use all the modern uh, 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 technology available to, to, to scientists to do 3D uh, capture, uh, to do uh, uh, all, all manner of things uh, with hard science. And so I think that there was a, you know, if, if there was any excavation, it was very, very limited indeed. So there's geophysical survey, of course, and probably probably lidar, and probably also um, um, I'm just trying to think of the, the term. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of hard science gone into this particular project, and I think in some respects that this is the way forward. Uh, I, I'm seeing that in, increasingly within British archaeology as well, whereby sites in particular sites which are open air which are in fields where there's a where there is not too much of a complex stratigraphy these are now being evaluated with with machine they be the 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 areas are being exposed and archaeologists are now recording everything digitally rather than good old fashioned days when i was an archaeologist with a with a clipboard a pencil i hasten to add a 6d pencil uh Drawing I don't sections. even know what that is, frankly. Six sections and plans. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, 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 so everything is becoming digitized, and this is right. again, this is so. This really actually sort of opened my my eyes a little bit. Not so much to do with what they'd found, but the way they were dealing with the excavation, or not the excavation, but the right, investiga right. investigation of of the project. And so I was I was sort of heartened to see um, the way they were doing it. And again, I think it's probably the way forward in some respects. However. The big problem is, as you well know, that a lot of caves have what we call deep stratigraphy. And the deep stratigraphy can go down many metres. And I think at the moment, I don't think we've got that technology to work that, work that one out. And I just think I just think sometimes of Blombus Cave in South Africa, which has been dug for the last 30-odd years or more, uh, whereby they expose these beautiful sections with the, 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 the horizontal layers of stratigraphy going back 80,000, 90,000 years. Um, so I still think there's a, a need for certainly certainly university departments to be digging the hard way, like I had to. But this is quite a unique um, a unique investigation into looking at the 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 uh, the, the, the cave and its occupants eight, uh, sixteen thousand eight hundred years ago. So that's where I am with that one. <laughs> oh, oh, just one one other thing as well, um, Seth. Um, this was uh, this information was gathered from the Bradshaw Foundation website. Okay, okay, which I do recommend. And um, yes, absolutely, the Bradshaw Foundation is a they have a remarkable website that shows rock art and data and stories from all over the world that they have collected. They have wonderful images that you can look at and actually see the art yourself. Uh, Maybe hopefully, if uh, our good friend Genevieve has a chance, we can maybe set something up with the Bradshaw Foundation. I've heard, so we'll see. Yeah. Cross your fingers, there, everyone. Uh, but uh, definitely recommend checking them out. I will put a link in the description, but it's uh, it the website is what the name is Bradshaw dot probably org. I what, assume. What, 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 what I'll do, what I'll do is I've got the three links which go directly to the okay the, the areas, and I'll send those to you uh, for for listeners so Perfect. they can look at their leisure. Uh, and what I like about the particular this particular format with the Bradshaw Foundation is that they are compact, concise, and also more importantly, when you're reading them, they make you think. Not so much what's coming out of the out of the uh, the uh, the text. Of the people who are putting this stuff together, but they make you think about the, uh, the wider context 
of of the site that you're looking at which is always you know doing your own thinking is always a wonderful thing an exercise to practice exactly. yeah as we'll, yeah, as we'll as we'll see in my next discussion about another exactly site. And you your, know, just, turn. your turn, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, right before I get to my next story, just a little quiv here. You know, I love when people say, and, you know, they mostly say it online, oh, I did my research. Well, now, did you? Or did you just read the research other people did? You know, yeah, that's, yeah. Mm, I don't know. Even myself, I just got on a research project. It's the first one I've ever done. I have not called myself a researcher before this point because I'm a science communicator. I read the articles and I communicate what they say, but I'm not really doing research up until this point. So I just, you know, internet people, let's keep in mind what research actually is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, next story. We've talked about this uh, quite a bit and it's, the way that the Americas were first populated, which is a ongoing mystery for many anthropologists and archaeologists, although there are quite a few popular theories and some very unpopular theories that are finally, <laughs> uh, you know, going six feet under. But one of the most prevailing theories that has survived a lot of criticism for decades is the Bering Strait and or kind of ice highways. And that's what this paper, which uh, was, they highlighted it in Apple News, I believe last week uh, on Live Science, just talking about how these ice highways could have been used traveling from Asia along an ice sea to reach the Americas, not from, uh, you know, now the article states that they believe this was in addition to boating alongside the coast, which would cause another puzzle. They say about how humans managed to cross Beringia uh, in the first place. Now, this was published in 2023 in the journal PNA, uh, PNAS. And it originally focused on the sea currents along Beringia and was trying to figure out if they were passable by watercraft. During a new, new presentation of their findings on December 15th of the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco, the team highlighted the importance of the sea ice and its role in the possible migrations of early early, early, I mean, at this point, they're not early humans, uh, early Americans uh, coming over. And so basically what this is, is if you can imagine, we are again, we're in an ice age as George has discussed quite a bit and what that means and where the glaciers are at in terms of North America. And for many of you who are still trying to kind of capture what that means, you know, in Europe, they have the Alps, of course, but I can't name another mountain range in Europe. I don't know the topography the very well. The Pyrenees, there we go. Uh, you know, I don't know the topography super well, but it, I know in the Americas, so much of our landscape, we have these vast valleys like Yosemite and, I mean, these glories of nature and they were literally carved out of the earth by the retreat of these glaciers meaning when they melted and the glaciers started pulling back they literally because of their mass and how heavy they were carved the earth out and that's just fascinating so ice has played a huge role in the formation of the landscape and so the water at this time much of the ocean is caught up in ice and they're starting to think and have been thinking that people just walked along parts of the water that were frozen. And maybe when it unfroze, they took watercrafts along the coast, or they just found another part of the then frozen ocean that was still moving. And, you know, walking along ice on water, though, I mean, that could 
it could break up. It could, there's a lot that could happen. So what do you think? I know you are fond of the uh, Bering Strait idea. So what do you think about ice highways? I, 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 I get it. Uh, however, I would say that at one point, the Bering Strait and Alaska, there was a, probably a, a a landmass, albeit uh, for a very short time, at some point. I mean, the one thing I'm 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 always um, interested in is that we have our pre-Clovis question, which 20 years ago and before was, you know, the Bible, and so there was nothing roaming around uh, the north the North American landscape and certainly the South American landscape before 10,000 B BC, according to uh, American archaeologists. However, that's now been dispelled. And I would argue that we've got waves of uh, of uh, colonization, uh, maybe at least three or four major colonization um, events coming across the the Bering Strait into Alaska, down that 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 little bit of 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 land with the Laurentide to the east and uh, the Pacific Ocean to the west. And I I I, I still hold the view that. That is the, the the main and probably only area of how modern humans colonized the Americas. I don't think it came across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. It didn't come across the Pacific Ocean, and it certainly didn't come from the Antarctic Ocean. So <laughs> I feel, so I feel I feel that the easiest way forward was, and it was probably at a time, it was probably at a time, Seth, when we if you think about it, fifty thousand years ago, and I'm think I'm I'm going back that far. When we don't have uh, a Laurentide ice sheet, we don't have a Fenniscandian ice sheet, but we do have, um, a, you know, very lush green Siberian uh, uh, environment. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would argue, uh, and again, I'm not going to go down the, the argument of the idea of eustatic rise, because I don't know. Uh, and I don't think there's been much work done on that. This is where you've got land rising at a, at a at a different level or different rate to the sea level some of it sometimes is going faster and sometimes it's going slower than the rate of sea level and all, obviously you need a uh, for uh, you need a, a glacial episode for that to happen uh, but i think really from 50000 bc and with, let's face it the devendian ice sheet or the or the laurentide and the fenniscandian ice advance starts to take bite about 70,000 years ago and it's a slow process so there is that time there is that 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 ingenuity by modern humans that's you and I to get to Siberia and think hmm I fancy a holiday in the Americas and uh, so I, I think at 50,000 there would have been some form of land bridge or as you say it would have been iced up uh seasonally and that ice would allow, as they allow Inuits today, to travel across that very, very short uh, bridge between the two continents. So I, I, you know, it's conceivable. And the proof of the pudding is, as I said to you before, there's this idea of, of no, no such thing as pre-Clovis, but at Sawfish Cave, at Paisley Caves, and other caves that we're starting to look at now, we're starting to get dates of human activity, which goes to at least... Uh, the uh, uh, the the latter part of twenty thousand years ago. So between say eighteen thousand and twenty thousand years ago, we've got a, a wave of human activity coming into the Americas, and it's more than likely that these uh, these uh, uh, originate from what is going on with, by people moving through China, through uh, Siberian Russia, and going across that 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 bridge of whatever it, whatever it may be. But it was too tempting for humans not to do it. Absolutely. And, you know, we are a very curious species. It's we very hard are. for us. I mean, that's, that's how we've gotten to where we are. Uh, we would never have left Africa if we were not a curious species. Well, I mean, of course, there could have been the idea that we ran out of resources and you know, expand. <laughs> but besides that, being very curious has, you know, we wouldn't have gone to Antarctica if we weren't curious. I mean, you know. Um, yeah. So that absolutely plays a role. And 
yeah, I just I think it's an interesting. But like uh, I, think, said, I think listen, yeah, what I, I think I think listeners need to read and have a look. Just Google Paisley Caves in Oregon, and they are yeah. really are a revelation about what is going on. You know, and they push back the the time of modern humans coming into the Americas by. 100%. So it's, it's it's going towards the 20,000 mark now. And I think that's just one of maybe, I'll say, like I say, three or four waves of human uh, occupation. And the reason why I say that is because some time ago when we did our first podcast uh, together, I mentioned about the work I've been doing in northeastern Brazil. And we've got dates there of 27 to 32,000, uh, which is um, indirect dating on rock art uh, within stratigraphy that has organic remains. Uh, and that wasn't just from one one rock shelter, it was from two or three rock shelters. So quite clearly, there's something going on. And again, I've asked those questions to uh, to people who I respect in terms of rock art and, and also uh, dealing with very early uh, uh, migratory human occupation of, of the Americas, particularly South America. And they say the only way is north. <laughs> <laughs> so the only way they're coming in is from the north. Right, absolutely. Um, and I think that about, you know, covers that idea and that topic there. So why don't we talk about your next story that you have decided to bring us this week? Yeah, this is a again, this is another interesting one. It's uh, I, I, we're talk to, we're talk about we're gonna talk about our good old friends, the Neanderthals. Um, and this again, this is another uh, uh, story which was um, which was um, uh, uh, published uh, in December two thousand twenty three. So we're only talking a few weeks uh, ago. And this is a site called uh, La Roche Catard, and it's a it's a, again a cave site which um, uh, which was ha- has been excavated. This has been excavated in a traditional way. Uh, and they have dates there of Neanderthal occupation plus Neanderthal art, uh, dating back to fifty thousand years. And again, the MB note I would put on that one, uh, Seth, is we have to be really careful now. I think when we start to think about these these fantastic dates of fifty thousand, sixty thousand, because we are starting to push back those dates for modern humans coming into yes. the various parts of the world. So, so, so for example. Uh, at the uh, um, last year, I was working in uh, Mount Carmel in northern Israel, just uh, just east of Haifa, and there we have modern humans occupying that landscape at around about ninety thousand years ago. So this is where we have to be careful, and it's happening all the time. Every year that I get older, <laughs> I read yeah. the news, and there's and there's and there's someone's made a fantastic sort of statement about saying, oh, we've got uh, modern humans in this uh, in this part of the world, wherever it may be, at 60, 70, 80,000 years. And I, I'm still very, very cautious about um, about looking at the, uh, trying to prove if we've got Neanderthal art uh, based on dating. I just don't think we can do it anymore. Uh, so this is the reason why the first, m- myself, which I'm part of the first art team, we've been working with the Max Planck Institute on DNA analysis. And that will help us hopefully to seal up once and for all that we do have a good Neanderthal range, and also more importantly, and this is where I, this is where I'm definitely team Neanderthal, is that we, <laughs> they are producing they are producing art, and so these these guys, and it's been re, uh, it's been run by somebody from the University of Basel in Switzerland, uh, a, a woman called uh, uh, Dorota Wozniak, and um, she has uh, been working with a uh, a French team, of course because the site is in France, and the team from Denmark. And I dare say the Denmark-Danish team are doing all the sedimentology, et cetera, et cetera. And what is really interesting is it, it's, it's within the Loire Valley. So it's halfway up France, on the western side of, of France. And when I was a boy, when I was a, when I was a bum student, uh, mm. we had this statement. And I remember to never forget it. The statement was that uh, during the height of the uh, glacial uh, maximum, so back 20 to 25,000 years ago, uh, there was no occupation uh, by modern humans north of the Loire Valley. So I get that, but at 50,000 years ago, um, there could have been there could have been modern humans going right, into right. the uh, in, into the Loire Valley. Uh, however, based on the lithic uh, assemblages, and we got Mastyrian uh, flint coming up, uh, the usual stuff that you'd expect to find 
on a Neanderthal, Neanderthal site, we've got it. Uh, so that's uh, very, very interesting. It's really exciting. Now, the site itself was uh, actually known, has, has been known about uh, since 1974. But And this is where I got respect for the guy who discovered it. Um, he, when he made the discovery, uh, his name was Jean-Claude Marquette or Marquet. What, what was his name? Uh, Jean Claude Marquet or Marquette. Oh, okay. okay. If you're English, you say Marquette, but if you're French, you say Marquet. Marquet. Yeah. And uh, he <laughs> had the, he had he had the, he had the wisdom to say to himself, "This is bigger than all of us." So in 1974, 1974, he actually walked away from any sort of serious excavation of that site. So he waited until 2016, and then got in there and did a fantastic job. But has been working with Dr. Wozniak. Uh, and the team, and he's been advising the team about what they've got there, and so it, yes, it's so it's very very interesting. And what they've got there, they've got um, obviously rock art, um, but again, um, what's lacking is the DNA DNA evidence, as far as I'm aware. I would suggest this is not the end of the story. I dare say we'll be talking about this in a year's time when they have got DNA analysis, either from the sediments or from you know the, the golden the golden ticket, which is basically you know saliva or um, uh, or sweat from a Neanderthal on the pigment itself, so direct data, wow, sorry, direct, that, direct DNA. Yeah. So uh, that's quite exciting. So I think, in many respects, I mean, this is a, I think it's a, what we should always be thinking about to our listeners is that when we look at an archaeological site, and by goodness, do I look at lots of archaeological sites in my time, you find that they were excavated in 1980 or 1976 or 1903, or in the case of what we talked about last. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, 1870. The story doesn't stop there. I mean, you can go back to these artifacts and reevaluate them. You've got sometimes the sediments, some sediments within caves are still there. So there's a, there's a chance of doing, you know, good uh, meticulous excavation rather than what was going on in the antiquarian period. So in many respects, it's not just the archaeology that's dynamic in that it's going from Neanderthal to uh, to modern humans to uh, Paleolithic. Near, uh, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, and so on and so forth, but also the archaeological techniques that we're using are dynamic as well. We're getting new stories okay. coming out, and I would, I would lay, I would lay a pound, I lay a dollar, uh, that okay. um, that this this site has has yet more secrets to to reveal. Absolutely, and I mean when you're talking about you know pausing and waiting, I mean first of all, like you said, mad respect for that. That is crazy that you have the restraint to yes, not exactly exactly do what could have been done at the time uh but like you mentioned technology changes constantly oh, i feel like every time we recalibrate carbon dating which happens pretty frequently labs are working on pushing back how far we can actually pull carbon from you know, I learned in school, even last term, that carbon dating only goes back about 45,000 years. Now, all, yes. Dr. Tom Hyam, who you may know. I know Hyam, yes, yes. He has gotten dates reliably from 55,000 years ago using methods that he had developed at Oxford in his lab. So we're yeah. pushing back. Uh, carbon dating even with new technology now to me that is a red alert that says we now need to redate practically everything uh because uh, our dates yeah. are our dates are wrong <laughs> so yes that's that's so much work that needs to be done it's it's insane and then another thing about new technology that we learned uh, in the last few years is what we can find just from the sediments in the ground. DNA, I mean, you know, uh, proteins just in the dirt. And people, yeah. you know, you, you throw that in a scrap pile outside the cave. That's not what you do with dirt. You don't analyze it. But we, I mean, we now can learn that we have probably lost so much data by not, well, we didn't have the technology at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I draw your attention to the story I said a few weeks ago about Patherland Cave or Goat Hole Cave, right. which is on the right. which is in South Wales. And um, we've got there three date, three radiocarbon dating uh, programs, which were undertaken in 1964, 1990. And the last one was around about 2010, 
or thereabouts by the British Museum. And between the first date and the second date is 16,000 years. So yeah. that, and, and again, one thing I've learned, I mean, I mean, archaeology is a process of learning, certainly is for me anyway. Um, one thing I've learned with my first art colleagues is the idea of split sampling. So, you know, yes. we take we take a sample. It's very, very minute, but we've got the technology and the hard science to sort that out. We split it. One goes to one lab. Well, one sample goes to one lab. The other goes to another lab. And then we, we kind of do a Bayesian uh, uh, dating range or we can get some idea about the the dating range between the two the two um, the two the two samples, and that's very exciting. So the site I've been working on at the moment, a cave which I cannot mention for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. we're going back there again quite soon to do exactly that. We're going to be taking lots of samples uh, and splitting those up. We've got a um, a uh, Nanjing University in China is going to do all the uh, the dating for us for free, but. Uh, I'm hoping that I can split some of those samples and send them off to other labs around the world so they can give me an idea about what might be going on. Right. Absolutely. In terms of data. That is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, new technology brings new problems as well. And, you know, we'll just have to figure those out as we go. But it brings a lot of new opportunities and a lot of refiguring things out and I think we uh, there's a lot of you know for people who are looking to get into the field there's a lot of work to be done there so you know get involved so gee what I don't even remember what story we were talking about before we went off on our little we were, talk, we, were, we were talking about Gama Cave and we that's were right that's right yeah yes Okay, so I do not have another story, so why don't we go to your next story, because I know that you yes, do. that would be lovely. And then Just we can me. talk about our book reviews in a little bit. Or You have one yeah. book this week that we will be discussing. And uh, yeah. just from the title, it looks very interesting. And of course, as we've done in the previous weeks for season two, and I believe even the 2023 recap, I'll put the links in the description so you guys can check out those books for yourself. And uh, yeah, so what's your next story, George? Seth, I'm going to take you on a nice holiday to the Mediterranean. You deserve oh, it. Lovely. You deserve a holiday. I, I do. The I do. I really do. <laughs> one of the areas, one of the areas of for looking for early British prehistory is very, very much ignored, only because of the the you know, the the rich. Uh, ancient archaeology of the Greeks and Romans that we have in the Mediterranean. So in the eastern Mediterranean, there's a big island, a big long island called Crete. Mm, and yes. ag again, I just put the uh, listeners into the picture. About 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, the Mediterranean wasn't like it is as you see it today. It was a series of large lakes, uh, which were fresh water. And the inundation of the Mediterranean area to see what we see today occurs really in many respects from about 20,000 onwards. Um, and one cave that has been uh, recently excavated again, the information came out uh, from uh, around about December time last year, uh, is a cave um, uh, which has been found on Crete, uh, which has dates of 11,000 years ago. And again, you might think, well, you know, it's a little bit too recent. However, this is quite interesting because, again, the sites that we have within this part of the, the Mediterranean, uh, until we get to the, uh, the, the Levant of Israel, Syria, uh, Jordan, um, a lot of it is basically dominated by the, uh, by the um, uh, uh, by, 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 um, ancient history rather than prehistoric history. So the, the site I'm looking at is a site called, I guess right, it's Anthropestu Cave, Anthropestu Cave. And again, I'll send the link to our listeners so they can have a look and see what I am talking about. And again, it's an international team. Actually, one guy from Rhode Island, uh, the University of Rhode Island. Uh, and they've been looking at, again, using traditional uh, excavation methods. Uh, they've come across a, a very interesting stratigraphy. Um, and they've got this, uh, it's, uh, it's the reporter's words, not mine, but they call it, and I quote, a jumble of engravings. I love it. A jumble <laughs> of engravings. 
And those within that junk, within that uh, within that jumble of engravings, are engravings of megafauna, which is very interesting. So we've got things like red deer, for example, uh, a couple of um, um, extinct animals. I'm not quite sure what they are, but it's mentioned in the report. Uh, but it does give you a little bit of an in insight to what is going on in that part of the world, which we know very little about. We know a lot about Greek, Roman, archaic Greek, but we know very little about the um, um, about what's going on in that part of the Mediterranean. And there is one cave site, which is called Franche Cave, which I studied as a student, as an undergraduate, uh, which has a, a, a very much an identical stratigraphic sequence with lithics, all the things you expect to find in a late Upper Palatic site. Uh, no rock art hasten to add, although I would say this is the, and this is the big the big point. Uh, certainly, it's, it certainly applies to me uh, as a, as a an archaeologist, and when I'm wearing my paleo environment, sorry, my paleo anthropological head, is that we haven't looked hard enough. And what I'm finding now in a lot of cave sites, and I dare say you will be finding as well, Seth, is that you've got to look at the walls. Don't look, just look at the ground where the archaeology is. But there is, you know, sometimes very, very faint evidence of of, of rock art. And again, I found these this sort of stuff. And I dare say at Franche Cave, where there's no rock art, I dare say there is rock art. But we haven't looked hard enough. So this is, again, a very interesting cave site. Again, another one to, to add on the list, a uh, limited list of, of cave sites that have been excavated in using modern uh, meticulous scientific uh, uh, investigation techniques to understand what is going on with the, the, the can I get the word out, stratigraphy. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, like you were saying, there's just so much more we can get out of it that we yeah. we need to figure out. Um, what do you slightly off topic, but something we were discussing this week in one of my classes, which is actually titled Anthropology and Art. So quite applicable to a lot of what we're discussing yeah. and next week we're actually starting uh rock art and cognition and kind of that which is you know what i want to study but when do you think when we're looking at these caves and obviously it would have happened possibly early i don't know i'm actually i don't know when it would have happened i haven't decided in my head yet when do you think art as we recognize it gained agency or people. Okay, so that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, yeah. So if you pick up a, if you pick up a book by a very famous British archaeologist a guy called Derek Rowe, who's who's now passed away, but in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties he produced a very very good book on the Middle and Lower Paleolithic, published by Cambridge University Press, and the back page <laughs> you couldn't make it up, but the back page has a series of little beads which have been pierced, allegedly pierced. Um, and, it, and they're found in a cluster in a, in a in a quarry site in I think Cambridgeshire, which is in central eastern Britain. And he's asked the question, "Is that art?" Um, and again, I will go one step further, or one step backwards, better still. I would say we have to be careful how we determine what art is. So I would be thinking about the idea, and this is the term I use when I'm when I'm when I'm in my arrogant mood. But I use the term <laughs> visual communication system. So VCS, right. Visual Communication System. And I think what we've got, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to whisper that word to you, Seth. The leddy, the leddy, the leddy. And a writing star. <laughs> and I think, you know, we, we haven't got art there, I don't believe. I, but I do believe we have markings there, which right. are ways of communicating uh, visual messages to a small community of people. People who would understand what those markings are. When we, but it's trying to work out that transition between visual communication systems, markings, and again, I urge you to read um, Marshak, anything by Alexander Marshak. Again, he's a sort of, we say as an yeah, he was an archaeologist, and also Marshall Salins, who's an anthropologist, uh, who did a lot on looking at pre uh, Stone Age economics, for example, and um, they talk about the idea of the sort of the more sort of um the industrial side or the the uh the the non-cognitive side of producing marks 
to, uh, to, 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 to say meaningful things. Um, where that transition occurs between visual communication systems such as markings that we've got in, say, Rising Star Cave, and what we see on the cave walls of the Dordogne or in Australia or anywhere else where there's figurative art, is very difficult to try and work out. Because as you all know, when you start to look at the sequence of art and art uh, styles in prehistory, it goes through a series of waves. You go from geometric forms, which Genevieve has done a lot to talk about, uh, to animals. And I would say this is where we have to be really, really careful. When we start to think about the idea of the Magdalenian period or the Salutrian or whatever, these are vast periods of time. And it could be the case that at one point in the early Magdalenian, for example, it could be in the case that the idea of, of um, geometric forms was the fad, was the, the fashion. For, for for artists or people making these marks to do. And then they get replaced by exquisite figurative art. But then it goes back again to uh, to, to probably geometric forms. So there's a wave of artistic endeavor going right through uh, certainly the 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 the, the, the uh, upper Palithic. So say from about 40,000 years onwards, it's that thing that the, the thing we the problem we've got is going back further between that 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 magical forty thousand to say sixty seventy thousand, and I believe we're not we're not too far off from that, but even in within that sort of thirty thousand year period from forty to sixty seventy thousand, we're starting to see the idea of some form of endeavour, be it a, a communication endeavour or artistic, but I don't like using that term artistic. Right, 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 absolutely. Which it's just such a loaded word. So absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, careful how I use the. I'm careful how I use the term rock art. Uh, it, it's something which we've all fallen in, into the trap of. Yeah, you know, yes. I do it. I do it myself. You know, if I if I'm writing a paper, it's got the word rock art in it, and I, I should have a little MB note saying note. Uh, it's it's art, but not as we know it. And I think that's right. a good point to say. It's art, absolutely. but not as we know it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's and, and also point. and also remember, you know, I remember the Abbey Broyle. Uh, he did a book called Four Hundred Centuries of 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 Art," and he was talking about his discoveries, the discoveries he'd uh, verified in the years between nineteen nineteen o two and uh, nineteen fifty seven when he died. And um, within that book, uh, he talks about four hundred centuries. Well, if you think there are three, maybe four uh, generations of people. Uh, century, he times that by 400, and this is our problem. You know, from where we are now, where we have meaning for everything we do, right down to the McDonald's Golden M, we can tell you what yeah. that means, what it represents. We're we're completely divorced, absolutely divorced right. about what's going on. And I remember talking to somebody; he will remain nameless, but he once mm -hmm. said to me in a in a television interview which I was giving, no radio interview which I was giving, and he he said. Of course, I have. Give some ideas. Not English. I have the idea that uh, I have the idea. I know what the what art means in the Iron Age and Bronze Age. And he doesn't. He has no idea what it means. I mean, we. Uh, I mean, it keeps me in a job. Keeps you in a job as well to to try and uh, <laughs> make interpretations, which I think is important. But yeah. uh, in terms of understanding the full truth about what is going on, we will never know unless you can invent a time machine. So get moving. <laughs> Yes, right. I am working on it daily. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that, you know, I think it will be a great time to talk about the book that you would yes, like yeah. to review for this week. Actually, I've got two, in fact. I'm going to be a bit naughty. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I've got one book here, which again, I'll put the, the link up. I've just started looking through it. It's dated because it was first published in 2012 but it has been republished and it's called the british Paleolithic human societies uh, are at the edge of the prehistoric world so we're looking at that northern uh, that northern frontier land so it's the british Isles, and it's produced by paul pettit and mark white uh, both i've got a lot, a lot of time for both very very good scientists and that's been published by routledge uh the only problem is it's been republished but it hasn't been updated and that's a big problem because when you look through the book a lot of the ideas of 2012, as you well know, have been superseded. So that's one book. I'll send the link to uh, listeners um, when I or after this 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 um, this podcast. 
And then I've, got, I've, come across, I've come across this book. And again, another nice book, but it's been, again, it was published some time ago, um, about, about 15 years ago. But I think I'm reading it at the moment again, but it's well worth it. It's called The Rise of Homo Sapiens, The Evolution of Modern Thinking. And that's written by Frederick Coolidge and Thomas Wynne. Uh, it's published by Wiley. Another excellent book. Really gives you an idea about the, the mindsets of me and you. So, again, well worth a, a look, look at. And again, the books I'm recommending in many respects, I'm, I mean, I do apologise for taking the, uh, I suppose, the northern Eurocentric view of uh, reviewing books because a lot of them are in my backyard. Uh, <laughs> but certainly the, the Rise of Homo Sapiens is a good book for students. I, I, I do recommend it. It's a very, very good book. Awesome. And that sounds absolutely like it is a good book. And again, we will have links in the description uh, of wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. And I am trying to get the, or Facebook even, because now uh, we're putting the Paleo Post podcast on Facebook. Although this episode that you're listening to now is season two, episode two. And we just started putting the episodes on Facebook. So they're on season one, episode two, coming tomorrow. So just letting you guys know. But you can listen on there as well. So we're, we're spreading. We're trying to grow larger. And, you know, if you guys like what you hear, if you're supporting us doing what we do, then please give us a like, give us a subscription, rate the podcast, whatever that platform supports. Because every time you do that, one, it probably makes George and I feel really good about it. And I know it makes me feel good about it. Uh, but two, it really does help get the podcast out there, which just brings in more people that can learn, ask questions, that expands our education base. And that's really what it's all about, guys. Learning and having fun. I would also add, Seth, I, I would appreciate if anybody has any uh, negative comments to come through as well because uh, i say because of negative comments we can improve our podcast absolutely he, george has a very good point we always want to be improving and doing our best so if there's something maybe you want to hear less stories you want to hear more stories you think it's too long you think it's too short if you think we need to add something let us know we are here to listen we are here to change to make this better for everyone um because this is for you we we're taking our time out of our week so we can do something for you guys and if you guys aren't enjoying it and getting something from it you know we want to make sure you are so that being said either i missed the second book you were talking about or you did both right the, the second book was the rise of homo right, sapiens perfect, perfect the evolution of modern thinking Perfect. Okay, so we did that. And with that, you guys, I mean, I think we will, unless George has anything else he wants to add, call this podcast to an end and uh, wait till next week for the next episode. All right. I'm, so, I'm okay. Yeah. Perfect, guys. You know, again, drop a like. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know. And if you have questions that you want us to answer, you can submit those as well. You can email me directly at wordofthepaleoanthropology at gmail.com. You can leave your questions or, you know, concerns about the podcast in the comments on any platform. And just remember, have a good time. And as I like to say, you know, everyone's got their saying, Lee Burgers is never stop exploring. Mine is there's always more to learn. You'll hear me saying it constantly. It's written all over my website. And if you remember that, you remember that being a student for the rest of your life is one of the best things that you can do. You'll have a good time. And with that, I think we will sign off. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week. And that's it for me. Peace. And you. <laughs>